We just want to know that the both of you are safe. Um, the whole family loves you. The whole family wants you both home. To live this life that I've created for myself is hell. Hell exists. It's real. I know that. I can never again be sure that I know someone for who they truly are. You had no right. You had no right to decide when she should die. Today's case is one that literally happened out of nowhere and no one, even those closest to the perpetrator, saw it coming. It was literally so unexpected and shocking and to this day, we still don't have any clear answers for why this even happened. This case serves as a reminder that you never truly know what's going on in someone's mind. Everyone is fighting their own internal battles and some are better at fighting than others. But when someone suddenly acts so out of character in such an extreme way that we see here, it makes you question if you truly know anyone as well as you think you do. This is the tragic, devastating story of Maddox Lawrence. Maddox Mary Lawrence was born on April 24th, 2014 to parents Morgan and Ryan Lawrence. Ryan Lawrence is from Baldwinsville, New York. He graduated from C.W. Baker High School in 2009, but just before he graduated, his mother, Mary Lawrence, unfortunately passed away from kidney cancer in 2008. This obviously devastated Ryan. Losing your mother at such a young age is so incredibly difficult, and this was his first ever loss from the devastating disease that is cancer. After graduating high school, Ryan enrolled in Monroe Community College, but dropped out after taking two semesters. By 2011, he took a few more classes at Onondaga Community College, but once again, he dropped out. In the meantime, Ryan took up work at the mall, which is where he would ultimately meet Morgan, who is originally from Liverpool, New York. Both of them worked on and off at the same tea store, while Morgan also worked at a few different clothing stores. After dating for a bit, Morgan fell pregnant with Maddox, so her and Ryan got married so they could stick together and raise their baby. At the time, both Morgan and Ryan were working relatively low-paying jobs. They worked hard to make things work, but they lived a very simple life together. They lived in a small rented home in Syracuse, New York. They shared a car between them, figuring out arrangements to get both of them to and from work. Despite their financial constraints, though, those around Ryan and Morgan said that they had the best relationship. They absolutely loved each other. They were inseparable. They loved spending time together, especially going outdoors. They loved camping and hiking, and Morgan loved doing nature photography. And by all accounts, after having Maddox, their love for each other didn't change. In fact, Maddox's arrival just filled their hearts even more more. Maddox was described as having the cutest little chunky round face with the biggest round brown eyes. She had the best laugh erupting in her happiest moments, making everyone around her smile and laugh right along with her. She loved making these little monster noises and acting silly. She was healthy, full of energy, and so, so happy. When Maddox was born and for the first months of her life, both Morgan and Ryan absolutely doted over her. They were dedicated, caring, and did everything they could to raise their beautiful daughter in a warm, loving home. Their hearts were full, and they loved every moment they got to spend with her. At the time, Ryan worked as a delivery driver, delivering pastries for all of the Freedom of Espresso stores around Syracuse in the early mornings before the sun came up. And while on the job, baby Maddox went right along with him. He would carry the box of sweets in one hand and then the baby's car seat in another. He never left her in the car, even if he was only running into the store for a second. After the delivery, he would put her back in the car and drive on to the next door until sunrise. In the meantime, Morgan worked as a barista for the same shop that Ryan delivered sweet treats for. For the time being, both Ryan and Morgan were dedicated to making a living to support their daughter. They made their schedules for work so that someone was always with Maddox. They made just enough to make ends meet and they couldn't afford a babysitter, so that is how they made things work. However, just before Maddox's first birthday, Ryan and Morgan noticed a brown spot in one of Maddox's big brown eyes. There were these dark patches forming around the iris of her eye, growing bigger and bigger, covering the whites of her eyes. 
Obviously, they knew that this was abnormal, so they took Maddox to the doctor, who delivered some devastating news. Baby Maddox had a rare form of eye cancer called retinoblastoma, which is cancer in her retina. After this diagnosis, of course, Baby Maddox immediately started intensive treatment to get rid of the tumor. Every week, Maddox had to travel the four hours down to New York City to receive treatments. There, she sat for hours on end, undergoing intensive chemotherapy treatments that targeted the tumor in her eye, as well as the blood vessels that were feeding the tumor. Some of these treatments were as long as six hours. And of course, with these intensive treatments came medical bills. After family and friends found out about Baby Maddox's diagnosis and the course of the treatment she needed, they wanted to help out in any way they could. Maddox's aunt and Ryan's sister, Shaylin, set up a fundraiser to help the family pay for the expenses. She reached out to various extended family members, all asking for help with paying the medical bills. In the fundraiser, she wrote, With your donation, you can ease some high stress and give Maddox a better shot at kicking this tumor. And it seemed that the family had a pretty decent support system. Friends of the family, Maddox's grandparents, aunts, uncles, all came together to offer their love and support. They all loved taking Maddox to the park whenever they could, watching her play in the fall leaves. Family members would watch Maddox for periods of time while the couple worked, always enjoying every second they got to spend with her. They also helped the best they could financially, raising around $9,000 total to help towards her medical expenses. With that, Maddox continued her treatments and things were looking up. Almost a year after the diagnosis, Maddox was starting to recover. Treatments were helping and Maddox was on the tail end of her recovery. She was going to beat her cancer. But still, after receiving this diagnosis, having to drive so far to these appointments and having to pay for it all really put a strain on the family. Before the cancer diagnosis, Morgan and Ryan were already struggling to make ends meet. But now, things were 10 times harder. The family were struggling because not only was there this financial burden of the medical bills and then the gas to get to and from the appointments, and I'm sure there were times where they had to stay overnight in a hotel because, you know, these treatments were really long and it was a four-hour drive both ways. But obviously, the stress of just not knowing if their daughter is going to make it, seeing her struggle, seeing her suffer from these treatments... All of that was putting such a huge strain on the family. As Morgan worked as a barista at the coffee shop, regular customers and coworkers all heard her talk about Maddox's problems and how she was dealing with them. She was doing everything humanly possible to save her daughter while also working hard to make her bills. One of the customers actually got Morgan a gig taking photos at their local Salt City Horror Festival, which gave her a chance to make some extra money. But... After that, it seemed like Morgan suddenly lost interest in doing photography. And after that, she quit her job at the coffee shop. This seemed like such a sudden change for Morgan. No one knew what caused that, but it was clear that Morgan was struggling not just financially, but mentally. By around 4 p.m. on the afternoon of Friday, February 20th, 2016, Ryan dropped Morgan off for her shift at Francesca's boutique. Baby Maddox was riding in the car along with them. After being dropped off, Morgan watched as her husband drove off with the baby in the car. Morgan's shift was until around 10 p.m. that night, so she was expecting Ryan to come get her then. But instead of Ryan returning to pick her up, he sent her a text saying that the car was in the parking lot of her work. This confused her at first, but she went out and found her car in the lot with the keys in it, so she drove home. But when she got home, she was horrified to see that the house was empty. Neither Ryan nor baby Maddox were home like they were supposed to be. She searched around the house for any signs of where they could have possibly gone. And that is when Morgan found a terrifying video message that Ryan left for Morgan. In the video, he told Morgan that he wanted her to live a better life without him. He said that he took Maddox with him, but he didn't say where or what he was going to do with her. Immediately, a panicked and hysterical Morgan dialed 911 to report her daughter as missing. 
In the report, she said that Ryan had a history of mental health problems. He had a history of depression and anxiety, and he was dealing a lot of personal issues beyond his daughter's cancer. I'll get more into his mental health later in the video, but obviously knowing this history, knowing that he was struggling with their current situation, Morgan felt that Ryan was very unstable and unpredictable, having no idea what he was capable of at that time. By 11.30 p.m. that same night, officers arrived to Morgan's home to speak with her and start their investigation. Morgan told them that Ryan was most likely last known to be in that parking lot of her work since they didn't have another car. He had to have dropped the car off and walked away from it with Maddox. She described that Maddox was around two feet tall with blonde hair and brown eyes. She was last seen wearing a white t-shirt with brown puppies and a pink collar on it. She was wearing pink pants and a blue coat with pink on the inside. She had on these little brown suede shoes and a gray knit hat with pom-poms on it. Knowing this, and knowing that Ryan was most likely the person who took her, authorities issued a statewide Amber Alert so that the public could keep on the lookout for this adorable, sweet baby girl. From there, police started their searches. They searched the immediate areas via helicopter. They also brought searchers to all the nearby lakes and creeks. They checked the abandoned homes in the area, the airport, train, and bus stations. They found that no one with Ryan's name purchased any sort of train ticket, no plane tickets. They looked at different surveillance videos from those bus and train stations and found nothing. At this point, police and the family were absolutely baffled by this bizarre disappearance. Morgan told officers that yes, they were struggling financially, they were coping with the cancer diagnosis. But through that, she felt that they were strong. They stuck together through it all. He wasn't known to use drugs or alcohol. There was nothing that could give them any direction or reason for why this was happening. However, they did say that based on that video Ryan left and the sudden nature of this situation, it was clear that Ryan was emotionally unstable and was not thinking clearly. By February 21st, by the second day of searching for Ryan and Maddox, Morgan went in front of the cameras at a press conference to beg Ryan to bring their daughter home. She said that she loves Maddox and just wants to know that they're both safe. It's clear that Morgan is emotionally drained and exhausted from all of this. Her voice is shaking, hoarse, and full of panic. Please just bring Maddox home. Maddox, I love, I love you, honey. Um, Brian, please, just please call. We just want to know that the both of you are safe. Um, the whole family loves you. The whole family wants you both home. And, um... We just want to know that you guys are in a good place and um, we'd love to see you both as soon as possible. Thank you, man. Uh, give me one second. I'll take some questions if you have that. For two days, there were massive search efforts done to find this baby girl and Ryan. However, there was no way they could have known that all this time, their efforts were not going to lead to Morgan reuniting with her baby because her baby had been dead this entire time. And the truth of what happened to 21-month-old Maddox is so much more tragic and horrifying than anybody could have imagined. As I stated, after the search efforts for Maddox began, the police and media were pushing Maddox's story and face everywhere they could. The public were all to be on the lookout for this little baby as well as for Ryan, who they knew took her. Well, by February 22nd, there was a former employee of a thrifty shopper store on Downer Street in Baldwinsville who believed that they spotted Ryan. As I stated earlier, Ryan is from the town of Baldwinsville, so this was a store that he frequented growing up. So this witness who used to work there and just so happened to be shopping there at that time recognized Ryan in that store despite the fact that he was wearing a disguise. At the time, he was wearing a wig, hat, bandana, and sunglasses. This witness was also suspicious when he saw Ryan because at that time, Ryan smelled strongly of smoke. 
It seemed that this worker must have seen him enough times in that store to see beyond his disguise. Of course, this former employee had seen Ryan's face all over the news and knew he was connected to his daughter's disappearance. So they called 911 to report the sighting. After that, she followed him out of the store to make sure she knew where he was by the time police arrived. When police pulled up, they spoke with Ryan, who initially tried giving them a false name of Rilo Rivers or Rio Rivers. I'm not exactly sure which one he gave, but based on how it was spelled, could have been either one. But turns out he hadn't really prepared the name he gave to officers because he couldn't spell the name correctly. He also told police that he was 21 years old and gave his birthday as August 22nd, 1989, but officers told him that this age and the year he was born did not match up, so they knew this was obviously a lie. Finally, after being caught in all of his really terrible attempts at lying, he finally gave officers his real birthday, removed his wig, and said, you got me. After this, they put him in the police car and brought him to the station for questioning. When they picked him up, they looked in his backpack, which contained camping gear, as well as a book on how to avoid capture. And police noticed immediately that he did smell of campfire smoke. In that interview with police, which ended up lasting a total of 15 hours, Ryan started off by saying he didn't do anything to harm Maddox. She was safe. He assured police that he actually gave his baby to another couple, Chris and Tyler, who are now caring for Maddox. He stuck with this story for hours in that interview, but he couldn't keep any of the details straight. He said that the couple took her to another country, but at one point he said that they took her to Mexico, and at another point he said she was in Bolivia. Then, as the interview went on, he started referring to the couple as Chris and Taylor, not Tyler, so he couldn't even keep the names straight. After detectives picked up on this error, they called him out on it. It was at that time when Ryan admitted that this couple was made up and he said, you won't understand when I tell you what I did with Maddox. As this interview went on, he called himself a good father multiple times. He referred to Maddox multiple times as an amazing, beautiful child. Then, after quite a long time, he did start opening up and being more honest. He mentioned that he had issues with facing his emotions and always felt like he needed to be in charge. He opened up about the death of his dog, which had a profound impact on him, though I want to warn you now, what I'm about to say is upsetting, but some reports say that Ryan actually killed his dog. Apparently, the dog was also sick, so Ryan took him outside and strangled him to death to stop his suffering. Now, this was not something that Ryan mentioned in the police interview, though. He just said that the death really affected him, and I just happened to see that other articles mentioned that he might have killed his own dog. Either way, finally, after hours of talking with investigators and dancing around the subject, not wanting to fully admit to what he did, Ryan admitted that he hurt his daughter and gave police all the details of what happened to Maddox. It turned out that in the days before Maddox's disappearance, Ryan was busy preparing for what he was going to do. He went to the store and purchased a bat, a wig, sunglasses, and that bandana, all which he used for his disguise attempt. Then he went to an area near Tinker Falls to dig a burn pit in preparation for what he planned to do. On the day of February 20th, after dropping Morgan off at work, Instead of going home, Ryan drove himself and Maddox to Tinker Falls in central New York. This was known as one of Ryan's favorite places to visit. It's a very popular tourist spot in the summer, but it's pretty isolated during the winter. After bringing her to a spot where Ryan knew he would be alone, he grabbed the baseball bat that he brought with him. As he raised the bat to his daughter, he said to himself, God, if I'm not meant to kill her, make her stumble before he started beating Maddox in the head with the bat repeatedly until he killed her. Then he placed her body in that fire pit that he had previously prepared, burning her body for hours. After this, he put his daughter's charred remains in a container and brought them with him to an area near the inner harbor in Syracuse. He then threw that container into Onondaga Creek, which was near where Morgan worked. 
He then dropped the car off in that parking lot before walking off. After that, he walked from Syracuse to an abandoned house in Clay. After staying there for a night, he then walked all the way back to Baldwinsville, now wearing his disguise. He tried staying outside and out of the eyes of the public for as long as he could. But by February 22nd, as temperatures dropped and he had nowhere to go without a car, he walked into that thrifty shopper store on Downer Street in his hometown. He was there to buy a comforter to shield himself from the cold weather conditions, but as we know, this is where he was recognized and apprehended. However, obviously, him being caught like that wasn't part of the plan. He actually had this whole escape plan in mind. The book he was caught with is called 100 Deadly Skills and is basically a survival guide written by Navy SEALs. It details how to elude pursuers, evade capture, and survive any dangerous situation. He also had a handcuff key with him and a camper stove. He planned on surviving the elements as long as he could, wearing his disguise and avoiding capture for as long as possible. Maybe he could even escape the area once the heat was off and go about living his life somewhere new. Now, as he was telling these details to the investigators, he did get emotional when speaking about what he did to his daughter. Also, as a part of the interview, police took him in a cruiser to have Ryan retrace his steps and show them exactly where he went. After finding out where Ryan threw the remains of his daughter, police started their efforts to recover them. And by around noon on February 23rd, around 36 hours after the initial Amber Alert was issued, police did retrieve the container in which Ryan kept his daughter's body. And as they expected, her tiny little body had been badly beaten before her body was burnt. After the discovery of her remains, police charged Ryan with second-degree murder. At his first court appearance, he pleaded not guilty to his charges. Then, about a month after his initial arrest, his charges were upped to first-degree murder. The reason it was upped from second-degree to first-degree was because he clearly had planned and premeditated this. He dug that burn pit ahead of time. He purchased a bat to use to beat Maddox. He got that book on survival and supplies for his disguise. It was clearly a planned murder. After all of this came out, with Ryan being charged with the murder and family and friends finding out about just how brutal and violent her death was, people were shocked and devastated. Of course, Morgan was absolutely heartbroken and so were the rest of Maddox's family members. Even Ryan's own siblings came out to express just how disappointed and disgusted they are with Ryan, saying that no one could have ever expected this level of violence from him. At the same time, of course, those around Ryan wondered what caused this. What could drive a man who was once a loving, doting father, genuinely caring about his child, to then kill his own baby who he was supposed to love and protect. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Ryan did have a history of mental health problems. He was diagnosed with anxiety and depression, and as it turns out, there were a few times in which police got involved with Ryan because of these issues. In the years before Maddox's murder, Syracuse police had been called to deal with Ryan after different incidences involving his mental health. We don't know the exact details of these incidents. Police have not released what these were all about or if he was violent in any way. It seems that he might have been just because of the fact that police were involved, but he also could have been threatening to harm himself or something like that. Not necessarily something that involves hurting another person, not necessarily domestic violence, but still warrants police involvement. Either way, Ryan was never charged as a result of these calls, but obviously having the police called on you for mental health issues is always a concern. His family members also came out to say that they knew he had severely struggled with mental health for pretty much his entire life, but again, they really thought that Maddox was such a positive thing in his life. They really thought that the amount of joy she brought him and the amount of joy that Morgan brought him was enough for him to be able to cope because again, they can help him through these issues. They can be a source of light in his life even when he's in his darkest moments. They never imagined that he would ever reach this level of violence and just mental instability. But still, 
even through this confession, with knowing about his mental health, no one could figure out why exactly this happened. For the months that followed, Ryan sat behind bars awaiting his trial while the prosecution and defense both built their cases. But then, seven months after the murder of 21-month-old Maddox, Ryan actually changed his plea. He was now pleading guilty to kidnapping and the first-degree murder of his daughter. After his plea, it was time for sentencing. At the sentencing hearing, the prosecution brought forward their theory for why they believed Ryan murdered his child. They said that Ryan was jealous of all of the attention baby Maddox was getting after recovering from her cancer. She was taking all of the attention away from him, and no one was acknowledging his role in the whole thing. No one showed him any appreciation for how he cared for his daughter during her treatments. No one talked about how strong he was. All of the attention went towards Maddox. Everyone was talking about how strong she was, how brave Maddox was, how much of a fighter this little baby was. Morgan was probably also paying much more attention to the baby than to Ryan. And according to the prosecution, that is what led to this gruesome murder. Ryan took his jealousy and pent-up anger out on this little baby to get rid of her and bring the attention back on him. Meanwhile, others talked about how young Ryan and Morgan were when they had Maddox. They were in their early 20s. They were already struggling financially when they had their baby, but when she was diagnosed with cancer, that burden just got heavier and heavier. This took a massive toll on Ryan's already struggling mental health. So, for whatever reason, he just snapped. Instead of allowing Maddox to make her full recovery, instead of getting to watch her live and thrive past this disease, he took those chances away when he murdered her. At the sentencing hearing, Morgan spoke for the first time publicly since that press conference. And let me tell you, watching that video of her speaking is heartbreaking. She's still so devastated. Again, this was just months after the murder. She can barely get the words out. She's violently shaking and hysterical, trying her best to compose herself. I can't even imagine being in her shoes. She called Ryan selfish and irrational for what he did. She didn't get any answers, no closure in this. She started questioning herself in this and how she could have trusted and once loved the man who would be responsible for the murder of her child. I the audacity of his actions to make such an uneducated decision on behalf of everyone in Maddox's life. Any one of our family members or friends would have gladly taken her from you if you had just told her that you were feeling you were going to harm her. actions have left me with no answers or closure. Brian has not only taken my daughter away, but also abandoned me as well, leaving me with feelings of extreme loneliness and sadness. The situation also leaves me questioning my own judgment of others' intentions and their character. Burying my daughter alone was the single most hollowing experience I've ever endured. Knowing that her death was at the hands of the man that I once loved and trusted with our lives, shakes me to the core because of what Ryan has done. I can never again be sure that I know someone for who they truly are. Ryan Lawrence's actions have affected the lives of others as well. Maddox was loved by everyone she met. She was strong and inspiring. She's missed greatly by everyone who knew her. And those who are very close to her, such as our family, are heartbroken and outraged. I want her to be known for who she was, and I want to be known for the loving mom and wife that I truly was. As a result of Ryan's actions, I, I need for him to spend the rest of his lifetime in prison. I fear for my safety, and I fear for the safety of, safety of others who are back into the community. 
He's deceived everyone in his life with ease. And he's betrayed all of us with his actions. Other family members of Maddox also spoke at the sentencing hearing. Maddox's grandparents, aunts, uncles all spoke about how devastated they are, how disgusted they are with Ryan's actions. No one could possibly understand how Ryan could have done this. Ryan's own brother, Rich, called Ryan a stranger and a murderer. It is so unfair that my daughter had to experience this tragedy let alone live the rest of her life with this sad reality. I wish somehow I could have protected her from this loss, but I could not. I am also the deeply saddened grandfather of Maddox Lawrence. I miss her every day as I wake up, reminded of what Ryan Lawrence has done. I cannot fathom how a father is able to take the life of their own child. The killing of Maddox totally infuriates me, completely disgusts me, and ultimately saddens me. But it has also created in me an overwhelming feeling of loss. Before Maddox was murdered, on my days off, Morgan would drop her daughter off for the day, my daughter would announce when she saw me, hey, look, Max, look who it is. It's your best friend. <laughs> I would feel so honored. I wasn't yeah. just grandpa. I was Maddox's best friend. Tea party was one of her favorite things to do. She loved this American girl doll table chairs, and tea set. She would actually sit on the small chair and play with the cups on the table. And then we would just do whatever Maddox wanted. Of course, I would tickle her every chance I got. Her laugh was so hearty, her smile so big. She would look at me with her brown eyes and melt my heart. I miss those days. I feel robbed. How unfair of a decision Ryan solely made for innocent Maddox, as well as for all of us. Ryan, as I sat down to write this statement, I, know I had to choose my words carefully. Because these are the last words I'm going to speak to you. I thought I was going to tell you that the brother I once knew is dead. And what's left is a stranger and a murderer. However, I know that is not true, and deep down, it's not what I actually believe. You are a stranger, and you are a murderer. But you are also my brother. You didn't turn into someone else. You weren't possessed. And you weren't acting against your will. You are my brother. And you are 100% responsible for your own actions. As it turns out, the brother I thought you were never actually existed. Beyond your facade, and you had me fooled. And finally, after hearing from all the different family members of Maddox, Ryan spoke at his own sentencing hearing. There, he apologized for what he did. He apologized for taking away Maddox's chance at life and for the pain and sorrow he caused the family. He said that he misses Maddox and talked about how she was the best thing that ever happened to him. He said that he isn't jealous of his daughter and that his family knows that he only ever loved and supported her. He then spoke about his mental health, saying that he dealt with negative emotions. He was constantly dealing with the uncertainty and fear of what would happen to Maddox while she was going through her cancer. He said that he had no reason for why he did what he did, and he doesn't even understand it himself. It's incredibly hard to talk about this for many reasons, and even harder to find the words to explain such a horrible crime. It's with all of my heart that I convey my sincerest apology to everyone for taking Maddox from her family and everyone who loved her. I'm also utterly sorry for denying Maddox her chance at life. I can't expect your forgiveness. 
but I tell you now that the sorrow I feel for what I've done is complete and comes from the deepest depths of my being. This sorrow I feel has nothing to, nothing to do with being in jail, but for the pain, for the loss of madness. I miss her so bad. Max is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and the best thing that's ever happened to me. I'd say that to her all the time and to anyone else who'd listen. It was amazing to have her everywhere I went, including all the times I brought her to work with me. When our baby was diagnosed with cancer, we were in shock, but hopeful that the doctors in New York City would cure her, as indeed they did. Even after enduring countless overnight trips to the hospital and fruitless attempts at soothing a baby who couldn't possibly understand why she couldn't eat for hours before invasive, invasive treatment procedures, the threat of her cancer returning was very real. Our work schedules were arranged so that one of us was always with the baby, but there was very little time for the three of us together, nor enough money for a sitter or much of anything else. Still, we treated her and fed her better than we did ourselves and loved her far more than anything else we've ever known. In no way can I justify my actions and there is no one to blame but myself. There is no good explanation for such a horrendous crime and regret is too simple a term to describe what I feel. What I can say is I've never felt such strong emotions towards anything in my life than my ever-growing and unconditional love for Maddox, and now I'm completely distraught by overwhelming grief and anguish for what I've done. I was never jealous of my daughter. Both our families know I love Maddox. If anything, I only wanted more for her. Max was always at the top of my list, and is constantly, to this day, the focal point of my thoughts and actions since she first came into my life. I'll never overcome this feeling of loss but I will spend the rest of my life trying to figure out how I got to such a dark, irrational state. She was my life's purpose, and making her happy was my job. Such strong feelings of love, however, brought equally strong feelings of fear and uncertainty when it came to my responsibility for her happiness. Although I blame no one else for my acts, as the pressures to save, to give her the perfect life, Built up, I also struggled against relentless waves of negative emotions every day, bearing witness to the pain and sadness in many of my wife and daughter's interactions. Yet no reason and no psychological diagnosis seemed plausible to me to have made me commit this act against my very nature, taking the one thing I love most. This Easter, my father, weeping, asked me what I was thinking. In despair, I gave him the only answer I could. I don't know. Although these pressures led me to this unthinkable act, I cannot now make sense of what I did. There's no valid reason for why our daughter Maddox had to die. Not a second goes by when I don't wish I could take back what I did and that Maddox would still be alive. I pray all the time that she's in a better place and that God and my mother are watching over her. At the end of the sentencing hearing, the judge also expressed his intense disgust and disbelief for what Ryan did. He said that he cannot fathom how a father can take the life of his own child, especially in the way that Ryan did. The judge said that he wants Ryan to spend the rest of his life in prison for what he did, but due to the fact that he made this plea deal, he was ultimately sentenced to 25 years behind bars. There is no term for a parent who loses a child. That's how awful it is. I say this to you in, in order to describe to everyone in some small way the scope and breadth and devastating result of your callous and selfish and horrific acts in taking Maddox's life. You had no right, you had no right to decide when she should die. And what you did not kill was the love in the hearts of so many relatives and friends. That love in their heart their hearts will live, live forever. It is a sentence in judgment of this court that based upon your plea of guilty, the murder in the first degree is charged in the first count of this indictment that you be sentenced to the maximum sentence of life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. Relative to your plea of guilty to murder in the second degree is charged in the third count of this indictment. It is a sentence in judgment of this court 
and to receive the maximum sentence of life imprisonment with a minimum of 25 years. And by law, these sentences uh, must run concurrently with each other. At the time, Ryan was only 24 years old, so this means he will be out in his 50s, which of course is just devastating and basically means he has a whole life to live once he's out. The rest of Maddox's family wanted to see him behind bars for life with no possibility that he could live the rest of his life when he is released, but that's not what's happening here. After starting his prison sentence, Ryan did an interview from the prison. In that interview, he said that he has created hell for himself in that prison, living with what he did. He also spoke about what he did and said in the moments before he beat his daughter with the baseball bat. And this time, instead of telling you exactly what he said, I will let you watch that interview for yourself. But being in this cell with nothing but my thoughts is tormenting. So, I mean, I can't close my eyes. I can't sleep. Uh, just having to, having to, um, to live this life that I've created for myself is hell. Hell exists. It's real. I know that. And I've created it for myself. You don't have to die. I want to jump back to that day that it happened. You're, you're in the woods with her. Do, do you speak to her before it happens? Do you tell her goodbye? What, 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 what goes on between you two before? Yeah, I told her goodbye. What did you say? I told her, Max, we're going on another trip. I'm going to see you soon. Daddy's just got something to take care of real quick. I told her I loved her and she was the best baby in the whole world. <laughs> Were you crying? Yeah, I was crying. Did she say anything or do anything? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really want to talk about this. Okay. So you were thinking about down the road covering up what you've done to to keep from being prosecuted. Yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of people would hear that and say, "Well, you were just trying to get away with it." And and not be, never have to pay for your crime. What, what, do you, what do you say to those people? I'd say that's ridiculous. I pay for it every day, even if I wasn't out. Yeah. I'd st I still wake up. <sighs> I still wake up hearing her voice. I still, I still, every time I close my eyes, I see her and what I've done. I have to live every day without her. It's pretty clear that Ryan is living in a world of self-pity. He really only has ever spoken about how this whole thing has affected him and how he has to live with what he did for the rest of his life, how badly he is suffering. To me, I think it's obvious that Ryan is a very selfish person. Whether it was because he was jealous of that baby, I don't really know. But I do think that he blamed her for their financial troubles. I think he blamed her for all the stress he was under. I think he was overwhelmed and was tired of dealing with it all. So he decided that he was going to solve the problem by taking Maddox completely out of the picture, rid himself of the stress that she was causing him. Truly, I I do think that that is why he did this. But at the end of the day, we will never have any clear answers for why this happened. Ryan truly is the only person who knows why he did what he did, and I don't think he will ever really admit to why he did what he did. All we know is that this precious little baby, this absolute fighter, and such an inspiration for so many other children is gone. She was getting better from her cancer, she was going to live a hopefully long, healthy life. But instead, her father took that chance away from her. He took her life and caused so much immeasurable pain and suffering to so many people. And that is unforgivable. But that is all I have for today's case. 
I know this was an absolutely heartbreaking, tragic case. I know this was such a horrifying case to sit through, but as soon as I saw Maddox's story, I knew I needed to talk about her, share her story, and hopefully give her a voice since her own voice was taken from her far, far too soon. But with that being said, I do want to hear what you all think about this case. Why do you think Ryan did this? Do you agree with the prosecution that he was jealous of the attention she was getting? Or do you think he was overwhelmed and snapped? Or do you think he blamed her for all the issues he had in her life? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell too on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure to follow me on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill up the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!